I said, oh my goodness. I'm glad to have Virgil here with us uh, this weekend. And uh, he's gotten taken all my tapes that were in here. I forgot I even had of meetings at Brother E-Step and all the stuff I had in folders. And um, he's got uh, all the sermons on tape, Brother Maddox, you know, uh, Earl, uh, and uh, Hasbrook, and just a lot of old ones. He's going to, he's already, uh, he's indexing them and, and cataloging them. He's going to put them through his machine, take hours and hours and hours, and then get them on, get them out there for people to listen to them, old timer guys and stuff. That would be a blessing. And uh, give them something to do, too. Keep them out of trouble. Amen. Amen. All right, I'd like to preach a message this morning on I love you more so you can love yourself more. You know this ain't my type of message, but that's the title of the message, I love you more. Who's doing the talking? Jesus. Jesus loves us more. Why? So we can love ourselves more. Mm. All righty. Got your Bible. Go to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. Some of us fellas just ain't uh, like most. Depends how you were brought up, family environment, you know, if you had parents and all that good stuff. And uh, that's how you learn to love, right? If you had hateful parents, mean parents, uh, more than likely you're going to grow up that way. And uh, the Lord changes that, though. He really does. He, uh, uh, in unique ways. And uh, appreciate him for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, dear God, we love and appreciate you. We thank you for your mercy, your grace, uh, Father, that you've given to us for the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, pray that you give me clarity of thought, liberty of speech, and pray, Father, that we don't act like technicians, like most of the time we do in, in dividing the book and everything, God, but we just uh, be receptive to the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Over in 1 John chapter 4, uh, there's songs written about this verse, and we hear it, and sometimes we don't really think it through, but in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19, verse 19, the Bible says, we love him, okay? That's good if it just stopped there. Okay, we love him, right? No, there's a reason, right, that you love him. What is that reason? Because. We love him because. Because what? He first loved us. He first loved us. I almost feel like praying again. <laughs> because he first loved us. And uh, simple message, we forget. Uh, just like this morning, we talked about angels. I mean, we forget about that. I mean, no biggie, right? And, uh, but in our lives, we've had experiences, if you really think about it. Matter of fact, uh, uh, because of our awareness of angels, you could even ask God, would you, would you sort of like, if something like that happens, an intervention or something that we don't know nothing about, would you enlighten me a little bit? You know, let me know. And so like in Hebrews, uh, entertaining angels unaware. Uh, you know, if a situation happens, maybe some of thought will come to you and say, well, how do you think that happened, Bob? You had, did you have something to do with that? Oh, wow, no, thanks. You know, because we just go on with life like, like there ain't nothing going on. No, you're, you're a child of the king. Everything's going on every day. If he would remove the scales from our eyes like we preached before, like that servant Elijah, I mean, we would see stuff going on and scare us to death. Scare us to death what's going on in the atmosphere but that we're protected because we're his kids. And therefore, we can love God. Love God. You can really, truly love God with that perfect love because he first loved us. That's an amazing thing. Because people say they love God. Go to Mexico, and, and really in Mexico, a lot of this goes on. Uh, they do penance. They, they kneel and they crawl on crushed grass, glass, they whip themselves. Oh, no. I said, you can go to Google. You can go on and find out what people do for Christianity. Carry their cross. Some of them are nailed to a cross. Absolution to get, get that, that sin uh, confessed and that God would honor it. That's hogwash. Why? Because God did it all. Uh, their love for God is in the wrong way. They don't have the right love. The right love of God is because we have been created by him. All right, go to, uh, you think about that love, uh, how did he first love us, and go to John 3.16, most of you memorize it, John 3.16, 
still in the Bible. <laughs> been, been uh, dispensationally messed with. <sighs> we look at John three sixteen and and uh, just amazing verse for God so loved uh, the world. Well, when did he love the world? Well, that he gave his only begotten son. Hmm. So what proves that he loves the world? He gave his only begotten son. And then, amen, that whosoever, what does that mean, anybody? Believeth, believeth, believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. How did he first love us? Oh, my goodness. When he agreed with the Father unanimously to come and redeem the lost from the devil's hell. How did he first love us? That's it. Um, I think about the love of God and, and uh, most of the things on TV and everything is about him being mushy to us and all this kind of stuff. And, and a lot of times they'll show God to the world, a lost world, that he's huggy, kissy face and all this stuff and He's not that way to a lost world. He's that way for his children. I have Bible on that. And uh, when I think of his love, the only thing the world's got to see is Calvary. Why? Because how in the world could God express his love more than Calvary? He couldn't. That's the epitome. That's it. If they don't get Cal Calvary, they ain't got the love of God. Calvary is God giving himself for the world. That's the kind of love that he had. After we're saved, we have the opportunity to have that love because he first loved us, and we have a giving, not a taking nature, if it's the new man. A lot of times, people are looking for promotion and taking this opportunity, taking that, and not paying anybody back, and just taking advantage of all this stuff. Christians, what are they doing? They're, they're taking, they're not giving. You get more when you give, just like the Bible says, better to give than receive. People don't understand that principle, but it is true. Uh, Dr. Noe told us a long time ago what he did to solve his problem of bitterness and everything. And so I think then he was probably 80-something, but uh, he said years, 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 years ago, he said, uh, these preachers that did me wrong, these people in the church that did me wrong, you know, all this kind of stuff, these people that did me wrong, he said, I prayed for him, number one. I don't know if it was Bob Jones Sr. told him, because that's who he was under. And, uh, but uh, he remembered to pray for him. And don't listen to nobody else telling you what, how to pray or not to pray. He said, just pray for them, even if you hate their guts. <laughs> he said, because I hate it. If you, I could just see him because I know him. I could see his face right now. I could see that nose curling up. I hated their guts. But my pastor told me to pray for them. He said, so I got my book, and I put their name in the prayer, and every day I pray for them. And after a month, he says, how's that going? Better. So I still hated her guts, but I was praying for him after a month. And, you know, and then he looked at me and says, oh, give him 500 bucks. You hearing me? <laughs> now, he's still praying, but he's still holding them grudges, right? And then I'm pretty sure it was senior told him, give him 500 bucks, you'll feel better. He say, preacher, are you trying to be hooking for money now? No, but it'd be a good idea, but no. So... What did he do? He gave the person 500 bucks. And the person knew they weren't worthy. They knew what they said about him. They knew what they did. And he broke down and cried the person and got right with them. And when he prayed for them the next day, guess what? It was altogether different. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Well, the reason he said that was it requires a sacrifice. Some people maybe 100 bucks, 20 bucks. But in doing that, he learned the principle. You see, saved persons, we all got flesh. We got perceptions in our brain. We got hatred. We got variance. We got a lot of things we're not supposed to have in there. And some of the safeguards, if you really, really are bitter and really hate somebody, would be, number one, pray for them. And ask God if they need an offering. Maybe something else. Maybe something else you can do for them. Because, you see, you get it off of yourself. You are practicing giving. You're giving of yourself. It's easy to do it when you're getting something back for it. It's most difficult to do. Really difficult.
difficult to do when you don't. But it's a practice that you do. And you can do it because the love of God can constrain you where at? Inside. Uh, just have a show of hands. Uh, we're in here. I can remember several people that had an experience of a camp meeting uh, when God's spirit came in. It wasn't a charismaniac type thing, but it was when God came in. Uh, do you all remember when you're just sitting there, minding your sweet little business, enjoying the service, and all of a sudden you start crying? Well, well let me ask you this. Who's doing that? The devil? No, God. <laughs> your new creature, man, is plugged in. And man, the love of God. You know that he's here. You know that certain things are taking place. Does that mean when, when that doesn't happen, he's nowhere around? Of course not, because we've got enough Bible that teaches us he can't leave us. And he's not going to forsake us. And there's no cancer in the body of Christ, so he's never going to cut us out. So all this stuff is available if we want it. The hard part is it's getting our want to change sometimes. And I'm just preaching this because I'm telling you, I know me. Lord have mercy. And man, it takes a lot. It just takes a lot. But you know, it happened enough to let me know that he's there. Because it ain't me. It's him. And I know that because I first loved him. How did I first love him? Because he first loved me. First time I could ever love him is after I recognized that he first loved me. And when you get saved, you get plugged into that love. Nobody else can love the Lord without him. That's where they go to the Greek. You know, the agape and uh, phileo and, and who don't do the eros. But, I mean, they go to all this stuff. Like, oh, you got God and you got this special love. Well, just say you got special love of God. How do I know that? I love him because he first loved me. That's the explanation. I don't need all sorts of gramma grammatical stuff. Just the Bible. Why do I love him? Because he first loved me, period. And think about how did he love us? Calvary. Not that he was mushy to me and hugged me one day and got me out of this or got me out of that. No, Calvary. I mean, what in the world? If you looked at all the different things that God's done for you, what is the apex? What is that top? He saved you. sacrificed everything for you. What else could he do? Well, I mean, what an act of, I mean, display of love. As a Christian, we want everybody saved. Every, every, you, you get on the Facebook, and now they're, you know, they always put um, the veterans. So they, they go all the way back to sometimes to recognize, to keep that in the, you know, before the people of the sacrifice that he's that gave their lives. And I look at that and I wonder, I said, man, for a patriotic cause, for the love of this country they gave themselves and they die and I want to believe that they're all saved but guess what if they haven't believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and got him they're not but man did they do a noble work ain't that hard to go I mean think about that that's why I tell you you talk to your Catholic friends you talk to this or that please please <laughs> narrow it down when did you discover you were lost and you needed to be saved? That right there will rock everybody's boat. <laughs> you got to say it sort of like that. When was it that you, you knew you were lost and you needed to be saved? You know, was it at your baptism when you didn't know who or what was going on? You just cried because the priest put you the water on you? Was it the communion when you first was able to eat Jesus? Or was it your confirmation when you were confirmed in the faith? I mean, but when was it that you knew you were lost? A sinner lost, and Jesus saved you. I'm telling you, you ain't going to get too many answers. They'll say, well, you got your way, we got our way. We're just, and, and the holiness will say, we're just keeping the commandments, keeping the commandments, obeying God. And you're sitting there saying, oh, my goodness, man, you missed the whole thing. You missed the whole grace of God, the whole, the whole reason he had to come. If there was any other reason, <laughs> he wouldn't have had to come. The reason is nobody could save themselves by whatever they did. He had to come. That's why he came. And when you think about that, 
How did he do it? Display his love? Calvary. Good old John 3.16. Number two, how did he execute his job? How about that? How in the world did he execute his job? Go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We are so protected in this country. That's why most of the missionaries that I've ever, they said, Brother Bob, you got to come over here. You just got to come over here. We had Brother uh, Dax, was it, that was here from uh, the Philippines, right? And he's saying, come on, we'll try to get money together. I'll get you over here to preach. And I just, uh, you know, we just couldn't do it. And uh, he says, you need to come here. It's not the United States. You need to come here. You know, then he'd tell me about this person getting saved or, or this sort of revival breaking out. And uh, because it's different, it's people that need everything. We have no need of nothing over here, it seems like. I mean, you can go to government and get anything, right? You're not going to die. If you die, there's, there's, you just ain't got the initiative to even try to get help. But uh, over in some of those countries, I remember my girls, you know, Kezi and Susanna went, was it Guam or Ghana? And she, was, she said, Dad, man, Phew. I mean, they wanted to go back. They were in villages where they were Muslim. But the Muslim factions didn't come down yet to stir them up. But they could have at any time. They could have died being over there. All the disease, she goes, man, when the light goes on, Dad, them black guys glow. She says, their continence glows. And when it glows like that, you get so excited. You say, man, there's a God. I mean, I know there's a God, but I mean, I'm, these people got nothing. And uh, we got the Allens that we uh, uh, love and been dear to us for years, and years, and years. They're in Papua New Guinea, and she says, "You know, when they, when light goes on with them people, you don't have to tell them nothing. They just, if they were naked, they put on clothes. If they were eating people, they stopped. If they were clubbing tribe members, they stopped. It's like, it's like something happens to them. You know." But you can visually see that. Here it's easy to camouflage. We're, we're just so overwhelmed with things. But getting over there, you can really see the transformation. And uh, it's a help to us to understand that. But sometimes maybe you need to just get out of the country if you can after this epidemic or whatever for a vacation about a week. And help some folks. All right. How did he execute his job? Who? The Lord Jesus Christ. He did it by suffering. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation, look what it says, perfect through what? Sufferings. Captain of our salvation, mean the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah, don't ever confuse 100% man, 100% God, when he was here, suffering suffering suffered a whole lot and then also in chapter 2 there look at verse 17 and 18 wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people for in that he himself have suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Like a mother giving suck, take care of people that suffer. Why? Because he suffered. How did he execute his job, our Lord Jesus Christ? By suffering. I mean, he suffered, figured, you figure this mentally. Uh, what do you mean mentally? Well, how many times you help somebody and you get stabbed in the back? That's a mental thing, man. That bothers you. It'll bother you. Just a normal person, not even saved. Help your neighbor, or help somebody down at work, or do this, you know, you're doing all this helping, and all of a sudden, you know, they flip you off or something, or they steal from you, or they do something. I mean, how's that feel? I mean, it's mental anguish. You suffer mentally. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ. You think about how many people he helped, and how they treated him afterwards. I'm talking about. Not the crucifixion and crucify him. That's later on. I'm talking about just after. And knowing that he knew their thoughts when he'd go in a crowd and all they wanted was to be healed, they'd care less about him. 
Or when you give that bread and fish, you know, all they wanted was something to eat, go free meal like we like. <laughs> Amen. I mean, that's, that's all they wanted. He knew that. That caused a lot of stress, a lot of mental anguish. You say, yeah, but he was God manifest the flesh. Yeah, but he remember, he didn't use that. Because he had, to, he had to experience what we do and what we go through. So he had to be tempted in all points like us, but not sin. So you think about that. Mentally, he suffered. He, you know, and spiritually. His spirit groaned uh, inside, remember that? Uh, by those who hurt and uh, those lost loved ones. When he, Remember Nicodemus? He came there and he was moved by the crowd because they loved him. You know, in that small verse, Jesus wept. That's because he was touched by others' feelings about what was going on. And uh, you need to remember, he suffered also spiritually. And Jesus wept, an expression of an inward hurt. And then he, he suffered physically. Man, you start going from the garden all the way to Calvary, my goodness. Talk about physical suffering. Shh. Now Christians understand what Christ has done. We must understand that. We know in 1 John, uh, go to 1 John 3, 16. Not John 3, 16, but 1 John 3, 16. The Bible says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. What's that, Calvary? And we ought to lay down our lives for the what? Brethren. We need to understand this. There's a transaction that had taken place when you got saved. You got saved because of Calvary. Our Lord in Scripture was a suffering figure. We got the idea every time we look at him that he's God, which he is, and we're thinking somehow that he doesn't suffer and uh, do anything like we have to go through because, after all, he's God. No, he was God manifest in the flesh that had to come and put on carnality, this carnal, right? Without our blood. So he could be a perfect sacrifice. Holy Ghost overshadowed. So you have our Lord living and breathing on planet Earth all the way to Calvary when he suffered and died, represented us, but he also interceded with everything that we've ever done or come in contact with, mentally, physically, or spiritually. He knew exactly how we're being tempted. He knew how powerful the temptation was. He faced the devil, like we'll face the devil, like in the garden there. And he could have killed the devil. He could have told the devil, go out and hang himself like Judas. He could have did all those things, but he didn't. He just said three words, right? It is written. It is written. It is written. That's it. Why? To show us that where's our help? It is written. It is written. It is written. We walk by faith, not by sight. So you get in the book, you find a promise, you see what it says. You say, Lord, can, can this be applied to me? I surely wish you'd do that. And you believe, you believe it. And something happens. Then he shows you what he does. When you exercise your belief, that faith kicks in. Then he shows. He don't show and then you believe. No. You ain't getting the results after you believe. Does he always do that? Nah. Sometimes he just does it before you even ask for it. You, all of a sudden you got the desire and you want something, boom, you get it. And, and I'm telling you, we're Americans. So we just go in nonchalantly and say, oh, okay, cool. We don't even forget to thank him. We just go on day by day. You and I both. The Lord says, I love you more. So you can love yourself more. When you understand what he went through, you understand the love that he displayed through all this. You think about yourself, you say, God, there's no way I can measure up to this. No way. Then you remember your new creature in Christ Jesus. God, can you help me? And it's not a uh, it's not a one shot, it's an everyday shot. We beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, right? To be not transformed to this world, a cold, dying world. But be what? Transformed in that mind, the renewing of the mind. You do that from reading the scriptures and praying. 
and then every day is a new journey because you don't know if you're going to live that day, right? Live it out? You're not going to know. I don't know. But we take everything for granted in America. Our forefathers gave the blood. Our soldiers gave blood to keep us where we're at, took it for granted, and now we're suffering the consequences because we refuse to be vigilant. Vigilant makes you think about things and guard. What does the Bible say? Walk circumspectly. In association with our adversary, the lion, walks around you, watching for a weakness. And man, we've all been, all been messed with. Teenagers here, the, the young kids, I mean, the young, 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 young people here, uh, Michelle and, and Maddie and, and Emily, I mean, they've been touched by this stuff, whether they recognize it or not. When they get their mind all jacked up and starts going crazy, they're saved kids. I mean, who do you think's doing that? The Lord? No. But he allows that stuff for us to wake up and say, whoa, shake yourself up and say, man, what's going on here? And what do you do? Go somewhere. Go to the bathroom. Go to your room. Go somewhere and say, oh, God, man, I'm messed up today. This is nuts. You haven't done that? Sometimes it takes me a month or so. I'll be driving my car. Finally, if somebody saw me talking to myself in the car, they'd freak out. I mean, I almost come close to cussing at myself. Are you nuts? What in the world's going on? You know, really, I mean, you know, you're just taking over. And you just go your mighty little way. Why? Because I'm getting raptured out. And when I die, I'm going to heaven. Hallelujah. And if I just look, and love is appearing, I'll get me a crown. I'll slip a crown in there, too. Oh, my goodness. The Bible talks about if you're doing that, guess what you got to do? Purge yourself. Because on the world, can you love his appearing if you're, if you're acting a fool? Acting a fool ain't thinking about loving God's appearing. You don't want to get caught doing nothing stupid, dummy. So you do. You got to purge yourself. Yeah. Certain things you got to catch on and say, man, you know, I allowed this to go too far. This is crazy. Because I'm security. I mean, I'm in that security of believer. I believe it. I believe God teaches that. Man, I'm resting in that so I can do all this other stuff. I don't think so. You got to get that thing together. And every now and then you need to wake up, find out where you're at. You got to take inventory. And uh, so anyway, uh, you know, <laughs> the Lord says I love you more so you can love yourself more. And we see uh, how did he love us? That was at Calvary. And we see that uh, how did he execute his job? By suffering. And we know that he suffered mentally, spiritually, and physically like we will. And uh, we know from 1 John 3.16... Uh, that God's uh, sacrificed uh, for us. And uh, the Bible says, Hereby perceive we the love of God. Notice how that's connected with this. What, see the perception? So this, this, this message is doctrinally, scripturally correct. When I said what I said about the love of God, we love him because he first loved us. This perception in the verse, you see, we love God. Why? Because, see the because? Because why? He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the who? Brethren. Didn't say the world. That's the other thing the devil's trying to hook you on. In John chapter 17, Jesus Christ said, I prayed for them that you gave me. Didn't pray for the world. Oh my goodness, but, but, but you don't understand. No, you don't understand. You better read your Bible. We're connected. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are not lost. We are not the devil's kids. We are his kids. We have special privileges. He prays for us. And we're to lay down our life for the brethren. Brethren are to save people. What about the other ones? Well, because of, your, because of our Lord's sacrifice we're given, that's in you. Somebody, let me just camp here a little while. Hmm. A long time ago, in the eons of the 50s and 60s, Parents would tell their kids in gym or whatever, you learn, uh, you learn, well, you can not Red Cross, you learn first aid. You know, you have the gym classes back then, they used to teach you some first aid. Uh, you get a little older where you can breathe better, and you learn that CPR. Now, you can't do that, you can do some of the first aid to yourself, but basically, all this was teaching you to help somebody else. You know, somebody passed out, you can save their life. 
Later on, you go in the pools, you're swimming, guess what? You learn all about trying to save somebody from drowning. And when you get them out of the pool, what, what to do with them? Why? To save their life. If anybody ought to be in line learning all that stuff, it's a Christian. Why? Because you're saved. Others out there that you can help that aren't saved, you can save them from dying and going to hell. And it's the same reason I carry a gun. I know where I go. I'm going to heaven. But I don't know where you're going when you're pumping your gas, somebody tries to kill you or snatch you or do something. But in my power, I'm still living and breathing, I can stop that stuff. You can give your life for the brethren, and you can give your life for others. That's the greatest sacrifice in the Bible. Others, others, others. You learn things not to boast, you learn things to help others. And you do that because the love of God constrains you to do that. Because he's in you. And his personality and his attitude and everything, it's others, not you. Not you. And that's something to think about. And then in 1 John 4, 9, we see that God's love for us, toward us, what a blessing. And this was manifest, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live, how? Through him. Do you see that? You see the association with the love of God? Do you see how it's connected with the son, the only begotten son being given to us? You know how you received him? You got him, you got his love. You got his perceptive on, perce uh, you got his uh, perception on things. If you want it. That's why we're supposed to be patient. Don't jump at the first thing, ask God to help you. Think something through. You may just get what the Spirit's going to tell you. And it may be different than what you're thinking. But it's so hard for us. Why? We're Americans. We plow right through. Now, in the very end, when stuff hits the fan, oh, God, I'm, I don't know what's going on. And I'm trying to do my best. You know, I try to do my best. We go through the whole list. And he says, but when did you ask me? When did you just calm down and ask me? Never. And 1 John 3, 1. Still under, he suffered physically, right? And uh, as Christians, we understand what Christ has done for us. In 1 John 3, 1, uh, the Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon who? Us. That we should be called to what? Sons of God. Therefore the world, please get this, therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Do you see that? It knows us not. It is in darkness. We are light. We shine the light in their darkness. The Bible says that the darkness comprehendeth not. So that's why people are, don't understand you, and they won't. I don't care if they're religious. They don't get what you've got, because what you've got, you got from God, and they didn't. They got it from religion. That's why I ask them, when were you lost? When did you know you were on your way to hell? Don't have to give me a bunch of theological stuff, just, you know. I mean, w when did you discover this? Now, most of them were brought up in a religious thing, and they did what that religious order told them to do. And when they didn't, when they finally did it, they were satisfied. That they did what they were supposed to do for God, and then live like hell the rest of your world, and hope you get the last rites, hope you got, you know, uh, keep the confession going, and keep the eating Jesus going, and everything's cool in that religious world. But to have the peace of God in here, knowing, knowing that when you die, you're going to heaven. I'm telling you, there's some questions you need to ask people. Why? Because you're responsible. You're saved. And if they're not, you're responsible. Whether you like that or not, admit that. You look at that again, chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. There. Look what it goes on, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now look what verse 3 says. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself, 
even as he is pure. And then it goes into, you know, the transgression of sin and, and what's manifested and what you need to do with it and taking it to the Son. But the gist is here, that we're of God, and he's in us, and the world can't comprehend everything that we know. So stop presuming upon religious people that don't cuss, don't chew, don't hang around with people that do, and profess Christianity, yet they don't know when they cross from death unto life. And they don't know that because nobody's really fronted them off with it. When were you lost? Isn't that simple? When, do you, when were you lost? It could be when you're 12, 5, 6. There was a time when you were scared. And there was a time when the Lord came in and relieved you of that fear. There was a connection. And uh, a lot of us had doubts later on because of our fleshly activity, but the way I was re uh, reassured was by God. He said, you know, don't stop calling me a liar. <laughs> you did what you're supposed to do, and I did what I was supposed to do. Sorry about your mental condition, <laughs> you know, right? And if you got that, then something happens on the inside that transforms you. And you know when you ain't got it, so how did he first love us, Calvary? How did he execute his love? Through suffering. And uh, three, our change. Our change was our gain. But it was also the world's gain. Uh, we go to Ephesians chapter 2, still in your Bible. Matter of fact, all those people that are working their way to heaven, they hate it when you go there. As soon as you go there, it says, well, we know you were going there. Well, okay, wait a minute. If you know, then you know the verses. You either believe them or you don't believe them, right? You just always remember Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And you got your little thing down, really, as a Christian. You know, I mean, it takes you from salvation and, and carries you through through his work. Ephesians 2. Uh, verses 8 says, uh, For by grace are you saved through faith. Okay, so we got grace, and we got the, the uh, avenue is through faith. And uh, it says here, And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You cannot work for a gift, it's given to you. And it goes on to explain that, in case you didn't get it. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And in verse 10, a lot of people forget that. They just go, uh, those first two verses there, and we try to show people that you can't work your way to heaven, amen? But look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship. That proves that he's doing something with us. He's working with us, right? Created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works, not bad works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk, walk in them. So our change was our gain, but it was also the world's because what happens to people, their whole culture changes. If they were mean as sin, stealing, and all that stuff, guess what happens when you're saved? Boom, reverse. So it helps society. It helps the culture. Less people saved, more problems. More people saved, less problems. Because it's a lifestyle, right? But it was created in Christ Jesus. So sure, there's ups and downs, and people have their bad days, but as a whole, you get somebody changed, they just stop what they were doing wrong, and they start doing things that are right. Then also in Ephesians 1, we have the formula that I told you before, that uh, if you're looking at how this takes place, Ephesians chapter 1, and in verses 13 and 14, it's in a nutshell. I mean, it's just right here. And uh, I don't know how anybody can miss that. In whom ye also trusted, okay, I got to trust in there, right? I have to trust, right? How do I trust? Well, after that, you heard the word of truth. Okay, the gospel came to you. What was it? Death, burial, resurrection, Jesus Christ. You heard it. That was the truth that you heard. And it talks about the gospel of your salvation. Now, look, look what else here. In whom also, after that, you what? Believed. So you heard the truth, right? Heard that gospel of your salvation. And then you what? You believed. And then after you believed what took place? I like it. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, you know, down payment money, of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. I mean, them two verses, what a blessing. You had to believe on the Lord. And if somebody was a mathematician, there's probably a, probably a three-point formula in here or something. 
We used to know a guy that was taking the, uh, the Bible apart dramatically. I don't know if he ever finished it. You know, uh, diagramming it, the stuff I hated to do. Anyway, this guy come up with all sorts of stuff just by diagramming it. My goodness, I wonder how, how many threes you would get out of this Bible. You know, anyway, that right there is amazing to me, the formula of salvation. And so our change was our gain, and it was also the world's. Because you know the way you used to be and the ways you used to think. I didn't say that you got rid of it because you're still covered with flesh of it. But I mean, something inside of you changed. And our change by God was not a reformation, but a new creature. And that new man is sealed with the Holy Spirit. When we believed the gospel, we were changed. And that included our love. Romans 5, 5, of God's love by his spirit through us constrains us. To look upon the world as dead to God and alive to their father, which is the devil. Go to Romans 5.5. 5. See, when you start getting the Bible, God's perspective is the Bible. When you start, when you start getting the Bible and you start seeing how simple uh, the verses are, Ain't about a whole lot of different interpretations. It's one. When you get it, when you get these simple verses, then you can look around and you say, man, I'm in the midst of corruption. I'm in the midst of a dark time. Man, and I'm the only light, only? No, there's, there's, everybody says it's got light. But you start to understand there's, there's, you're not kumbaya with people. You know, you're pleasant, you're a Christian, but your job with people is to find out where they're going when they die somehow. You work with them, your conversation with them, find out because you're there for a reason. Once you do your job, fine. And you just pray for them. It's no biggie. But uh, doing your job is a trip. So in Romans 5, 5, the Bible says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. We're sealed with that Holy Ghost. Therefore, guess what? The love of God is in there. He ain't leaving so if we don't have it shed abroad, we need to be praying and find out what's blocking that little avenue and ask God for some help. That help always helps. So if we're surrendered as ordered, as a reasonable action, according to Romans 12, 1 and 2, as we quoted, the Holy Spirit's leading will be the perfect will of God for us. Now, God doesn't want folks to go to, be, to, <laughs> to a devil's hell, that's for sure. He doesn't want the wicked to suffer. And uh, the, the thing is, do we? And to be honest with you, a lot of people, my attitude is not right because, I, man, I almost wish they died and went to hell. A lot of people out there, the pedophilers and all those other kind of things that are happening in our country, just die and go to hell, man. That's the way I feel about it. But when I see Christ in our dispensation, can they get saved? What made you better than a pedophile? Oh, preacher. Sin. Sin sends you to hell. Somebody had to pay the debt for that sin in Christ did. Sins of the world. He didn't list them all. Too many of them. But for all that were under bondage, all that are in darkness, he, di he died. And we need to remember that. Not to put up with it. But to remember that and to pray uh, for this. And he may say to me and others that you concur with that, but in deeds you deny him. What in the world did you just say? I said we concur with everything that the preacher just read, but the way we act does not connect with what I said. You will not pass out tracts. You will not pray when you eat. You just won't talk to people about the Lord. You just won't do it. You won't do it. Something's stopping you from doing it. Fear is the main snare. Right? Fear of loss of job, fear of loss of promotion, fear, 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 fear. Well, it's up to you to die to self. Let the light shine. You don't have to be like a street preacher. Sometimes you yell at them at work, and but good night. Opportunities present themselves, and it's up to you to use them. 
life short. If you're saved and the Holy Spirit has not led in that direction, that would make Scripture an erred book. Because we just read about the Holy Ghost. We read the love of God in association with Calvary and with the acts of the Holy Spirit that's in us because we're sealed, what it does, and we still deny it, something wrong. So I submit to you, this King James Bible has no errors, therefore the problem is us. We're too, uh, <laughs> we're too carnal in our thinking and in our activity for us to be led by God's Spirit. We have decided to withdraw from the battle and seek the rest of the world. That rest is sweet and easy in the world. You just got to keep your mouth shut so nobody knows you're a Christian. We have no missionary vision, therefore we do not support them. We have forgotten our first love, that love that comes from knowing we're God's, <laughs> we're God's kids. I mean, the fact that you're assured, you know you're God's kid, that's a special kind of love. When you first got a hold of that, you was excited. Something happened after that. I mean, we fear what God says not to, but we won't fear God and do what he says. I mean, you listen to worldly music, literature, and conversation, but you won't read God's word. Listen to preaching and teaching to maintain your spiritual awareness. I mean, please listen to me. If we love God, we can love ourselves in him. We may have a lot of struggles, and a lot could have been because of our upbringing. But entering life with no knowledge of a father, or maybe a divorce, or a father and no mother, or how about addiction? robbing the joy out of some folks or sex abuse a bunch of <laughs> there's just a bunch of legitimate reasons not to love yourself and not to love other people there's a bunch of them but I know this that we love God because he first loved us we love God because we can we love others because God did now our comforter our teacher our intercessor to the son will assist us with his power to walk and see and feel as our Savior did. Jesus said in his action, I love you more so you can love yourself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, dear God, we love and appreciate you. And a lot of times, uh, well, with the altar's always open, Father. And this pastor don't know if they're doing action or doing whatever, if they even got on. But you do, Father. Your word does not return void. And maybe even today, somebody will mention something at a restaurant or something like this in relationship to God, and they'll be able to witness for how great you've been to them. And God may be at work Monday. Who knows? But God, I pray that we would have more of an awareness, the awareness of those that are lost around us in this dark world. And God, that we'd have an awareness of you. Father, we know that the angels are around. Father, sometimes we forget you're around. So, God, I pray that you'd help Victory Baptist Church, little congregation, Father, but we can do big things if we connect. And we'll give you all the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen.